let me introduce um, our today's speaker. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Lars Dining, and he will speak about elliptic equations with degenerate weights. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, invitation. It's a pleasure for me to talk in your mathematical seminar in Rostov University and to see so many friends again, although this is only online. And uh, I'm happy here to see Stefan, which I haven't seen for a long, long time. And we have very good memories. We visited him once with our family and small son at his coast. And that was really a pleasure to visit this. So let me talk about um, the topic, uh, the mathematical topic now. This is a joint work, as you can see here, with Anna Balci, Antonella Passarelli di Napoli, and Raffaella Giova. I think maybe you have seen Raffaella and Antonella already in, in the video. So um, let me try to switch the slides. OK, now it works. OK, so what will the main focus of this talk be about? So I will talk about some regularity theory. Ah, Natasha. So I will talk about regularity theory for elliptic equations. So let me start with something very, very simple. So like Laplace equations, just to explain the kind of problem we are um, talking about. So let's think, let's look at the Laplace equation, like minus Laplace u is equal to some force in our context, the best if it is given in divergence form, so not like little f, but capital divergence of capital F here. And then if you look at this, and I write it a little bit more like this, so that you have the divergence of the gradient of u is the same as the divergence of f, uh, then you see that gradient u and f are basically on the same scaling level from the PE point of view, and you can look at the operator going from the force term to the gradient. And this is uh, a Carl and Sigmund operator, so that you know that you have a mapping from LQ to LQ. Um, and this is bounded for every exponent between one and infinity. So it's a little bit strange now that I cannot see anybody now. So I hope the technique is still working because you have to tell me if I'm too fast or too slow. And I usually can only see this if I have visible at least one person, but okay, let's try this. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to generalize this theory for like simple Laplace equation to weighted equations. So what do we do? Here we insert a kind of weight, which is kind of a matrix valued weight. So A of X is a matrix multiplied by the vector gradient U. So we are talking about basically scal uh, scalar equations. So it goes from omega or Rn to R. Um, or we also want to look at the nonlinear uh, equations, which are arising from weighted P Laplace equations, and then it looks a little bit like this. So if P equals two, this they are both the same if you just switch from AX to M square of X. Okay, I will tell you more about this later. So what we are interested in, in particular, is the possibility to have degenerate weights. So weights which are allowed to go to infinity and zero, but in a certain kind of uh, fashion, but they are allowed to degenerate at points, or lines, or whatever you want. Okay, if you have no questions, let's see. So let me continue. So there's an alternative formulation because you see, I wrote down two kind of equations. The first one is like divergence of A of X squared U is minus divergence of F. And we want to transfer the regularity basically somehow from gradient, uh, from the force to the gradient. And we want to show this for some kind of function spaces. There are different versions, so you can use LP spaces, whatever, BMO spaces, Hölder spaces. These kind of questions are interesting for us. But uh, to, um, to state our theorem, it's a little bit better to have an alternative formulation. So basically, I changed this forcing term artificially to this forcing term, which is very easy because you just say a G is A to the minus one of X. Um, F and F is an invertible matrix, so this is not a problem. It's just for beauty. So now if you wrote it like this, um, then you see it now behaves better because you have something multiplied by A and some forcing term multiplied by A. So here it is better if I look for the transfer from regularity from this term to the other one because it's sym more symmetric for the formulation of the theorem. What is the uh, version for the P Laplacian? So the version for the P Laplacian looks like this. It basically comes from minimizing the energy 
of this form plus some forcing terms. So if you minimize this, then you would end up with a P-Laplacian exactly in this weighted form. And I told you if we take M squared, we get A, or if you take the square root of A, we get M. So this is basically a weighted Laplace on top is a special case of uh, the P Laplace. So actually we started this project by looking at the P Laplace, and then later we realized that a few of the things that we, we do are also interesting for the linear case and uh, in particular dependence of the constants of our parameters. So um, not everybody is familiar with the kind of regularity what is to expect here. So I want to start with this uh, Maya uh, limiting example. It's very old, but a very good example um, and still useful on, on many, many things. So let me define it in terms of our language here. So we're looking at a function u, which goes just from R2 to R. So you need at least two dimensions that the PD is interesting, but two is enough. So that's a simple case. Um, then we take a weight, which is also a symmetric matrix, and this weight is given by a small perturbation of the identity matrix. So you see epsilon is almost will almost be zero. So all, epsilon is almost zero. Um, and then this one is just the identity, and this perturbation vanishes. So this is Laplace equation. But now if epsilon is bigger than zero, you have a small perturbation. And now Myers found out that if you take this function here, which behaves like x to the 1 minus epsilon um, times the first component of this directional vector, uh, then u is a harmonic function, harmonic in the sense that divergence a grad u is zero, so a harmonic in a sense. So this is a very nice coefficient because it's a perturbation of uh, unity uh, identity, so it satisfies um, the, the following estimate from above, so it behaves here like identity from above and from below it's just mon minus epsilon squared, so it's also very good. So this is an even nicer example than what I have in mind, because this is not degenerate elliptic, but still with this case here, which is uniformly elliptic, you can see already what is the limit of the theory. And certainly this limit of the theory will be valid also for degenerate weights, um, so this is a very nice counterexample in a sense. So first of all, since we are have a uniform elliptic weight, the corresponding energy space is a subalus space, so we get a weak solution in this space, so this is the easiest thing. Then you could apply Moser Nash de Georgi theory to prove more smoothness. What kind of smoothness do we get? Take a look. This is the regularity of U. So in particular, u is just further continuous with the exponent 1 minus epsilon. So that's easy. But what is more interesting for us, we are looking at the gradient, and the gradient basically behaves a little bit, uh, not in all direction, but it, uh, it behaves in principle like this. And now you want this to be integrable, and you will see immediately that gradient u is in the space LQ around 0, exactly if q is smaller than 2 over epsilon. Or if you don't like the smaller, you can just say it's exactly in this Maxinkiewicz space, L2 over epsilon comma infinity. Okay, so this is a very good example. Keep this in mind. I will go back to this example a couple of times. So um, what is the history about the weighted Laplacian theory? So this was the equation we are looking at. Minus divergence, matrix valued weight times gradient is equal to divergence f, and we replace this divergence f by the simpler expression. Uh, it's not simpler, but it's simpler for our theory. And what we want to look at, we want to look at conditions that allow to transfer the regularity of the data g to the gradient of u. And this is only possible because we have a solution. So this was first studied by Meyers in 1963. And he proved that if G has a little bit higher integrability than L2, which would be the natural one for weak solutions, then also gradient U has a little bit higher integrability. But this so-called Myers trick only allows you to go two plus a small number, so delta here. Then I think it can be found in many classical books. If the coefficients are uniformly elliptic in the sense here, let's say, and they're continuous, then you can basically show that you have higher integrability in all LQ spaces, so for all 
Q smaller infinity. And this was later generalized by Di Fazio in 1996. Uh, instead of continuous exponents, he looks at VMO and remember that VMO is the closure of the continuous function in the space BMO. So kind of he, he found out that the right topology is the one of BMO. You take the closure of your condition and you end up with VMO and you get high integrability for every Q. But what we want to do is we want to allow degenerate weights, which means, for example, weights with R here either go to infinity or to zero at the point zero, depending on if we choose plus or minus delta. We need this delta to be small later because we have a degenerate weight, but we want to have integrability for very large exponents. And the smaller the delta, the higher the integrability. And you have seen this in the example of Mayer, so there's some relation. Let me go back. So you see, depending on the epsilon here, you have limited integrability. And this we will see later again. OK, let me go forward again. If you have questions, please feel free to open your microphone and just ask me. Lars, we usually have questions after the talk, but if you prefer, it's OK with us. I will, it's, however, it's, up, it's up to you, of course. OK, if it's an urgent question, ask it directly. OK, let's do it like this. If not, then later. OK, so what are degenerate weights? Um, I mean, there are several definitions, and that's so that's why I have to explain what it is. So uniform ellipticity is like you have your matrix, and there's an upper eigenvalue and a lower eigenvalue, and these are bounded by uh, some upper and lower bounds. And this is uniformly in X, so independent of X. Now, degenerate ellipticity often is considered to be like the following. You have an upper bound, like so the upper eigenvalue and the lower eigenvalue, and these are related to each other. You see, the upper eigenvalue appears also the lower bound, but we have an additional constant here, and this lambda is a fixed but maybe large constant. So why are you square will be clear later, uh, because then at some point later the square will vanish automatically uh, when we are considering the square root of A. So the best upper bound here is ever replaced this just by, by uh, the largest eigenvalue. If A is symmetric, that's the spectral norm or the L2 norm, it is just the largest eigenvalue. OK, this means only the lower eigenvalue here. That is kind of interesting. So that would be now O, so A of X. And I can rewrite this equation in this following equivalent form. And maybe this is more known to some people also in numerics because this is just the condition number of the matrix. Uh, so the condition of degenerate ellipticity is just that the condition number of the matrix is uniformly bounded. So not the eigenvalues are bounded uniformly, but the condition number, and this allows degenerate weights. Okay, so, so then we're also looking at um, Sobolev spaces, weighted ones, and the corresponding, the correct um, Sobolev space that we need is basically this one. It's weight in u squared times mu of x dx, and this is basically this upper u of all. OK, so the first result that I know going in this direction is of Fabes, Kinnick, and Subway. Scrapioni, a very seminal paper. So because they studied degenerate weights exactly in this fashion, that the weight is an upper eigenvalue, a lower eigenvalue, and they're related by this constant. And they showed if the weight is in the Mukan class A2, I will explain what this is coming from harmonic analysis, and certainly if the force term is uh, um, smooth enough or whatever you need uh, correspondingly, then U is Hölder continuous. Um, so they proved, it's also, I think, scalar functions, they can they proved that if you have a Muckenhaupt weight, automatically it is Hölder continuous for some alpha. It cannot be for every alpha, uh, because we have seen in the, the um, example of Mayas uh, that uh, uh, the, that we only got C0, 1 minus epsilon, so you see there's a limit. Yeah. So what is Muckenhaupt weight? This is very easy to define in the in the two setting, so the Muckenhaupt case A2. You take the average of your weight, which is here, over a ball. You take the average of the reciprocal of the weight, and then together uh, 
it should basically be bounded. So if there would not be uh, an average, it would cancel directly. But this means that also averages of weights of the and the reciprocal they cancel and are uniformly bounded. This is um, this. Um, from a harmonic analysis point of view, you could, could also say it's equivalent to the boundedness of the maximal upper right hand space. But for us, it's the most important thing is that weights which are degen elliptic like this, they're included in the theory, at least uh, for small epsilon. Here, the epsilon doesn't have to be so small. I think it's a plus minus dimension half for the Muckenhauer, but later we need more smallness. And what we want to show again, I told you, transfer of the regularity from G to gradient of U. Okay. Um, and there, recently, there's a very nice paper by Chao Mangesha and Pan, 2018, so not, not very old. And they studied exactly linear equation with this kind of weight. So they have many more papers, interesting ones in this direction. But uh, the one that I need is this one here from 2018. So they took the same equation, the same degenerate ellipticity. And now they say like, OK, let's study degenerate weights. Let's assume that mu is an A2. What was mu? Mu was basically in our context uh, the largest eigenvalue of, uh, so it's mu of x, the largest eigenvalue of the matrix. So if this function now as a weight is in the Muckenhaupt class, and additionally, if um, the oscillations of A are in some sense small, I will explain what is later, small it means small also depending on the q that we're using now then we have a transfer of regularity and you see the space that we chose here is this one and the, the, this is uh, the norm for this space okay so what is this condition of on the oscillation it's, it's some kind of um, not vmo but small bmo norm but the small bmo norm is not really sufficient so they have a special BMO spaces. So in the first paper, they used a two, but basically that you can place it by a one because then the definition is much easier. They have this in the second paper. So what is the definition of BMO one? So you look at this usual definition of BMO, you take the weight minus the average, but instead of taking the mean value with respect to the Lebesgue integral, you take the integral and you divide by the volume of the weight. So mu of B is the integral of the weight over the ball b. So this is what changes here, the mu. So there's some scaling. And remember, mu is connected to a, so basically mu behaves a little bit like a, so you divide a by a. So uh, what you need is, you basically need that the average of this one is smaller than a small number than uh, the, this. So Basically, the oscillations of A are small compared of the averages of A. But the nice thing is that this allows to include degenerate weights for small epsilons. Unfortunately, in their result, uh, they don't have a direct dependence on delta on Q. You can track it in the proofs, but I, I fear that it's kind of exponential dependence. And I will talk about this later, what this means. So. Now it's time to present our main results. Let us start with a linear case. So that's exactly the same equation like Chao Mengesha Pan. Uh, we're only looking right now in this uh, project at local integrability and uh, up to the boundaries uh, for some later project. So the degenerate elliptic weight, um, now written in terms of your condition number, so condition is bounded. And um, sorry, um, and let me define now this weight omega, which is the largest eigenvalue of the square root of A. So remember, I wanted to have this basically that um, the matrix M is the square root of A, and now I'm using this weight. So mu, mu of X is the largest eigenvalue of X, and omega of X is basically the square root of this. But we need this to represent our theorem. So the theorem says as follows. Whenever the logarithm of our weight, I explain what this is later, is small in the BMO norm, 
small depending on q you see that the larger q is the smaller this number will be or if q goes to one then this one will be small so depending on um, if you are q small or large so if the logarithm measured in the b ohm norm is small then you have transfer of the regularity from g to gradient u and this looks a little bit different the one of uh, chao mangesha pan i will explain it below but let me first say what is the block of a of bmo so first of all a is a positive definite matrix so because we have a good matrix weight and, if, and whenever you have a positive definite matrix you can take the matrix logarithm so just to change from a to the diagonal matrix apply the logarithm diagonally and then you transform back so it's not very difficult to define this but now the bmo is a standard bmo so the standard bmo means take the function minus the average and the mean value and this has to be small but we are looking at the logarithm i have two slides later to explain why we use the logarithm but first of all let me compare now these two results so on the previous slide there was some oscillation smallness on on a by chao mangesha pan and they prove basically that you have this integrability l q mu dx and now if i change q here the weight does not change so the result they have is basically just changing the exponent q keeping the measure while here we treat the w as a multiplier so a multiplicative weight inside this means if we change the q the weight changes so in a sense the results are different the good thing in our version is that we have a linear dependence on the smallness parameter you see this is linear in a sense that linear in terms of the reciprocal uh, exponents but this is usually that you have always one over the exponent yes okay so I, I don't know if this result here would be valid for linear dependence this is kind of open question okay uh, but let me first explain how we get to our result so first of all um, I want to change a little bit uh, my problem I told you that here I have this a of x minus divergence of a of x squared u this is the equation and now I take the square root of this matrix a so I can write a as m squared so you see I replace it here by m squared and also here the thing is that um, why do I do this because then I can basically look at functions from the solution as minimizers of this integral and you see now this is nice it's just basically we're looking at minimizers of the Dirichlet energy but the gradient is multiplied by weight so this is a very nice interpretation let me rewrite the degenerate ellipticity I take the square root from everything that we did before you see and now all the squares vanish if I look at this in the terms of m and the condition number is just bounded in terms of lambda I told you we are looking at a multiplicative version of a weight so we are putting the weight always inside the norm and if we change here the two to something else uh, basically the weight changes because it's inside so I use this notation to indicate that the weight is a multiplicative weight and I use this with the dx to say that this is the measure okay these are two different things okay why is this space a very nice space this interpretation well first of all I learned this from David Koseribe probably you're well familiar with him that it has a nice representation of the dual space so if you have LP with weight omega as a multiplicative weight then the dual space is just p prime and one over omega so this is very 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 simple there's another uh, interesting thing so you can look at uh, Muckenhaupt weights so mu is basically omega to the p but now I reformulate it I look at this omega and then you see the weight omega to the p is a Muckenhaupt weight if and only if this is true what is it this is the p average of the weight times the p prime average of the dual weight one over omega and this is the ap constant it differs a little bit from the standard one by this power here but you see the beauty how symmetric this is um, now i want to talk a little bit why 
I'm looking at logarithms. So why are we looking at logarithms for the smallest condition to measure the oscillation? OK, I told you we measure the oscillation in terms of the B O norm of the logarithm of A, which is basically the same as the logarithm of M because it's just a square root. OK, X M should be just the exponential matrix, uh, matrix exponential and log the matrix logarithm. So this maps from symmetric matrices to positive definite matrices and the logarithm from positive definite matrices to symmetric matrices. Well, well, why do we want the logarithm here? So if we define the logarithmic mean, what is this? So this I use later in the talk. We take the average of the logarithmic weight and then we, we go back to the exponential. So it's a special kind of taking the the average, like the harmonic mean or something. This is kind of the logarithmic mean. And we can do the same also for the weight. And why do they do this? Because this is compatible with duality. So let's say this is a space LP omega. The dual space is LP prime one over omega. And now you can think about this. Let's say you start from LP omega with the weight and then you take the average. And then you pass to the dual. And you take some average. And you want that if you pass basically from here, um, from the average, and you pass to duality, you want this to be the same. And this is exactly if you take the logarithmic mean value. So if you take the logarithmic mean value, this is compatible with duality. This, so this is a very nice thing. Uh, there's another reason why it is nice. You can split the Muckenhaupt condition in two parts. The Muckenhaupt condition was that this times this is bounded. But you can split it in two parts, saying the first part is bounded by the logarithmic mean value and the second part by one over the logarithmic mean value. So the product certainly then this and this cancels is bounded. So this is a symmetric version of Muckenhaupt weight with this multiplicative weight and using logarithms. OK, what about the sharpness of our condition? So Let's go back to the Mayer's example. So we have a kind of perturbation of identity matrix as a weight. So it's a very nice weight. It's not even degenerate. Um, well, it's nicely degenerate. I mean, it's because it's uniform elliptic and the, the condition number is bounded by two. So this is certainly OK because it was uniform elliptic. Now let's look at the logarithm. The logarithm of this one, believe me, can be calculated. It is like this. And now this is smaller than epsilon. And the norm of this is smaller than one. So even in the L infinity norm, this would be smaller than epsilon. And later we require that the BMO norm is smaller than epsilon. So this is the example of Mayer's. So we know this is OK for our condition. We know exactly the BMO norm of the logarithm. So now let us look at the higher integrability. We know that the gradient is in this space exactly if epsilon, uh, it was always in this space, so we can determine from this um, exactly the integrability. And so what we need is that this epsilon here is smaller than 2 over q. So what does our theorem say? Our theorem says that if this one is smaller than a constant here divided by q, then we have higher integrability. And Meyer's example here shows that this is sharp because it's exactly this dependence logarithm constant over Q. Yeah, so just this constant here uh, is maybe uh, th that you can argue what is the optimal constant, but the dependency is sharp. And I think this is the main con new contribution for the linear case here in our, in our project. So let me talk a little bit about are these conditions uh, scaling invariant. So everything if you do should be scaling invariant, in particular if your equation is. So let's look at this equation and we have a degenerate elliptic weight. Then you can replace A by a larger weight scaled by a factor of T. You can scale the gradient, you can scale the T and you have again a solution of a similar PDE. And so whatever result you formulate, it should be scaling invariant under this simple transformation. So let's take a look. First of all, the Muckenhaupt condition of fabes kinnick sarabioni is scaling invariant. So this is nice. Then the problem is with this well-known result of Di Fazio is 
that this PM norm is not scaling invariant because it scales by the factor of t. So um, this is not good. And that's exactly why Chao Mangesha Pan formulated it differently. So you take this oscillation, but you divide by the integral of this measure mu. Recall, this was the definition. Now it's scaling invariant because A scales by T. This scales by T, they cancel, so it's scaling invariant. So what about our strange condition? It's strangely looking that this should be scaling invariant, but it is because take the logarithm of T times A. This means the logarithm will just get another constant plus a constant, but we are looking at BMO norm and BMO norm doesn't see constants. So this one vanishes once we look at the BMO norm. So it's also scaling invariant. Okay. So what about the weighted P Laplacian? Let me do this very short. So the weighted P Laplacian we, here, we start with two. Um, we then get this additional weight in front of it. And for beauty, we put the same weight here, such that this and this has the same scaling. The degenerate ellipticity is still the same. The condition number of your matrix should be bounded uniformly. And where does this equation come from? Well, this is kind of simple in a sense that look at this minimizer. This is a force term, so it's not so important. Um, you just take the gradient to the P, but before you measure it, you multiply it by the weight. And then this minimizes automatically this Euler-Lagrange equation. What is the natural energy? The natural energy is basically this behaves like omega, so I define it like this. So the natural energy space is just a space of functions where omega times the gradient of E is NLP. And later we want to increase this exponent P here to any exponent. Okay, what is known for the P Laplacian? So I, I put here a few names, but this is far from complete. Um, we are interested for this complicated equation, and this is how our project started, for the transfer of regularity from G to grad U. Yeah. And you see, this is kind of symmetric. We place everywhere on the left side gradient U by G, and this is the right-hand side. And this is like divergence of F, or like divergence of little f. Um, so the first one goes back to Ivanich and Caffarelli Peral. And they showed basically that if you have, I think, even no forcing term, but you can show that you have, um, if, uh, if M is the identity, um, then you have high integrability for every exponent P. And both also have results for um, uniformly elliptic weights with small perturbation. I will talk later about it. Then, um, Ivanich, Lewis, and Kino and Zhu, they proved uh, that you can even go here a little bit below P, which is astonishing because P is the exponent for weak solutions. So you can go to the concept of very weak solutions. So one would like to have here P minus one, but this is a still a big open question if this is possible. So the best one can do is P minus epsilon here. There's a paper by Kino and Zhu where this space X for the regular to transfer, oh no, sorry, um, Kino and Zhu. Uh, they extended this to uniform elliptic weights with BMO coefficients. So this is the counterpart of the theory of Di Fazio, basically. Then, since infinity is uh, excluded, there's always a question about the limiting space. It's not L infinity, the limiting space is BMO, the same one like it's a singular integral operator. And this was first shown by Di Benedetto Manfredi uh, for P bigger than two, but in this formulation here, it was proved uh, then uh, together with Petra Kaplitsky and Sebastian Schwarzachter and also for all P. Yeah, all P. And there are many things you have probably heard talks about from Kuzi, Minjone, Duza, Mali. There's an interest in that you can estimate gradient U in terms of Ries potential in terms of the force. Uh, you can also look at a higher regularity. So this means like... like of just LQ space, you take the sum space with extra differentiability. Uh, this has been done together with Anna Balci and Markus Weimar, but it's restricted to 2D uh, for, for this setting here, up to differentiability one. There are nice results uh, by Chunky in this direction also. 
there are weights in Masia, and uh, if you have weights in Sobolev spaces, there are works by Basio, Klopp, Jova, Robotic, Passarelli, Napoli, um, measured where the weight is measured in terms of Sobolev functions. And there are also very nice recent works by here, Kruseri, uh, Bemo, and Naiborotny, and starting with Modica, <coughs> where they just look at Muckenhaut weights. So no oscillation condition, but then the result certainly has to be uh, less strong, so they look at Hölder continuous functions. But this is far from complete, yeah, this list, so I'm sorry if I forgot some people. So what is the result that we have for the degenerate weight setting? Which generalizes basically the results from the previous page, in a sense. So whenever <coughs> Q is bigger than the natural exponent, so we are better than weak solutions, and if our measure of oscillation is smaller than some constant divided by this exponent, then you have regularity transfer for this Q. And see here this linear dependence on the logarithm with and the reciprocal exponent. The conditions scales well. It is sharp because of our Myers example. It's even sharp for P with two. So it's in particular sharp in this case. So what is the difference? Um, between the linear case and the nonlinear case. Well, first of all, here in the nonlinear case, we only have exponents Q bigger than P, while in the linear case, we have all exponents. And the reason is very simple. Usually always prove first Q bigger than P. Let's say if it's linear, Q bigger than two, if you are linear, and then you use duality. So then you get out with P, the Q smaller than two. In the nonlinear context, there's no duality which is of the same spirit and so you cannot use it so that's the reason okay let me talk a little bit about the properties of our logarithmic weights so um, these are two technical lemmas basically that we need in our proofs and it says the following if the logarithm of our weight in BMO norm is smaller than epsilon multiplied before with this exponent Q. So this is exactly the condition that appears in the theorem. Then we have a kind of your Nierenberg type estimate. This allows us to estimate, you see, the weight minus an average divided by the average. And we can uh, estimate this by this uh, logarithmic. And we exactly know the scaling. I mean, this is kind of standard John Nierenberg type estimate. So the larger the Q we want to have, the, the more we pick up this factor of Q. Um, you see already, this has something to do also with the BMO condition of um, Chao and Geshe Pan. This on the right hand side is ours, and this looks a little bit like their condition. Yes, so there's some relation. Um, the second thing that we need is if the logarithm is already has some smallness, so this is less strict than the above, uh, so it has some smallness, then automatically the weight is a Muckenhaut weight, so and Muckenhaut weight was constant at most four. So whenever we are in the context of our theorem, we automatically have a Muckenhaut weight, so we are automatically in that context, plus some additional things, which basically gives you this here. <clears throat> so I've prepared here a slide to compare the results uh, to Chao Mengesha Pan because we recently had, had a very interesting observation. This is together with Jose Glee and uh, Sin Suk Bion. Um, that look at this condition of Chao Mengesha Pan. This is how they measure it. So they measure the oscillation of A, but scaled by basically the average of A. And our approach is you look at the oscillations of the logarithm. And now what you can do is, this is uh, still going on, this uh, this work, so it's not published yet. But if what the oscillations, one of them, is below a certain threshold, so let's say smaller than some epsilon zero, from that point on, both terms are equivalent. So now you can say, like, if they're small enough, <coughs> then you can use the results from both worlds, basically. So if you have small logarithmic weight, you can apply it, put, apply the results of the paper of Chao Mangesha Pan and vice versa. 
Okay, but recall, I mean, this is based on this John Nierenberg type estimate from the previous page, but recall that the results differ. So our results has a weight inside and they have the weight fixed and just change the exponent. So it's a different result. <coughs> but what is nice that we have this linear dependence uh, on the, the constants here. Okay, what are the PDE techniques in our proof? I mean, for uh, I cannot go through all of it, but for the experts, um, this slide is probably enough. So first of all, if you have a log, if the the logarithmic uh, logarithm of the weight is has small BMO norm, then automatically our weight is Mukunov weight. So if you have a Mukunov weight, you have good function spaces, you have access to Sobolev embeddings, Poincaré inequalities, and so on. So if you have this. In particular, you have this Poincaré inequalities. You can start to derive Cacioppoli estimates, which tells you control the gradient by the function itself. And this means you can use this Myers trick <coughs> to get reverse Helder estimates. So you have in increased your integrability by a tiny bit. And this is just a starting block, just to justify the, the final steps. Then locally, you compare your solutions on suitable boards to a frozen system. So something where the coefficient is now a fixed matrix and not X dependent anymore. You localize this in some sense. <coughs> and now this is a basically P harmonic equation with some weight, but you can diagonalize and can get rid of the weight. So basically you're up to scaling here in the context of P harmonic functions. And P harmonic functions, they have nice decay estimates. And since H is close to U, times some truncation, um, you can transfer estimates from H from harmonic functions to U. And this is a standard trick. I mean, this is always the same things, and this is how we proceed. The interesting thing is how we freeze the coefficient, and here we take the logarithmic mean, and this is very useful for us to uh, get better estimates to obtain finally this nice linear dependence. So once you have done all these very technical steps, what do we in the end um, arrive at? So this is a similar simplified version of this. So let's look at this. So first of all, we take what is for the P Laplace quite standard. Uh, to, you take this operator. For P equals 2, V of C is just C. So you can just think of the identity. Otherwise, it's a standard operator here in for P Laplace. And what we prove is, let's say Z, is something almost like U localized, but this is basically almost U. So we show that the oscillations of this term with a power of two, so this is a sharp maximum operator that measures oscillations with the power of two, can be controlled by um, the maximum operator, so no subtracting, no oscillation, just averages. And the perturbation is depending on the smallest assumptions on our weight and some extra term. And this extra term can be chosen arbitrarily small, but on the cost of that, it appears at the forcing term. But you see, this is not a problem because it's small and the forcing term you don't care about. It's just a constant in the end. But we want to absorb this later in some sense. Here we have oscillations, here we have not oscillation, so we cannot absorb it directly, uh, but this is what is done basically to absorb it. And how is it done to absorb it? This is saying that once we have here the maximum operator, we can get rid of it, a Hardywood Lindbergh maximum operator, and then we end up with some function like this. And we want to control it again by the left-hand side. So we want that this is controlled by this one. And there's a very nice trick um, from Hardy BMO spaces, Hardy spaces BMO duality that tells you that whenever you have a product, this is bounded by the sharp operator times the maximum operator. And from this one, you can derive that you have this estimate here with this sharp dependence on the constant Q. And this is basically the key step in our paper. So now, once, now we can absorb the blue term and the left term after we apply the norm, okay? And this is possible if this term here in green times this Q which is this one is small. Once this is small, we can absorb it. And this gives us the final estimate in the end. Okay, that's kind of the trick. 
So that's maybe enough for the technicalities. Um, I can always go back later if you have questions to this. So we were very often asked, what is different from your paper to different papers? Why do you not just use the results of Caffarelli, Peral, and everything is done? So that's why I have prepared now this slide to explain ex exactly what is the difference. So let me explain this in the very simple setting of Mayer's example. So there's no forcing term because this is also the setting of Caffarelli parallel. We have a matrix. It's uniform elliptic, like in Mayer's example, with small perturbations. Okay, Mayer's. Um, Peral measures the oscillations with a different quantity, but in all these, uh, however you measure it, the smallest parameter is always epsilon in all the conditions, Chao, Menge, Chapan, our condition, and the one of Caffarelli Peral. Now the question is, how small do we have to choose epsilon, or how small does epsilon has to be, such that we get a nice regularity transfer? Um, no, there is no force, so I have to write as a local result telling you I can increase the exponent from 2 to any number q. And certainly it's localized, so from a ball to twice a ball. So for our result, this is the smallest condition. Epsilon has to be smaller than 1 over q. And now let's look at the famous paper of Cavarelli Peral, which is basically known to many people, I've heard. But there's even an earlier paper, which is not so much known, I, I was wondering, because it is like 16 years earlier by Ivanić, with the same result, also with weights. And both proved basically exactly this higher integrability result here for weights. And the dependence, I checked both papers, and the dependence is exactly like this. Epsilon has to be smaller than some constant times exponential of minus some constant times q. So this decays exponentially if Q goes large and ours only with one over Q. And this is a big difference. And I've prepared another slide to explain you why this is uh, um, why this is so. So if you look at the papers of Ivanić and Caffarelli and Peral, and let's say you reformulate it in modern notation, basically both of them are based on the following re redistribution estimate. It's a little bit simpler redistribution estimate because there's no forcing term, but it tells you the following. You look at the level sets of the maximum operator of your solution times a fixed number, which is 2 to the dimension plus 2. And now you want to estimate it by a smaller level set times an epsilon. And you have to place some conditions certainly on your exponents to satisfy this. But this epsilon <coughs> is basically the smallest epsilon for Mayer's example. Yeah. And now, how do you prove from this one? So this is proved by basically both of them with a different notation. Then you want to control the Q norm of Q. You can go to the maximum operator, and for the maximum operator, use Fubini to e express the, the norm by integration over level sets. Now you can use this equation here for lambda divided by k, so you end pick up here at k to the minus 1. But I want to go back to the same term as before. I have an epsilon. I want to absorb it. So I replace lambda by k to the lambda, and that's why I pick up from this one this constant, k to the q. So whenever I use this technique, I pick this up automatically. And now this term, the, the norm, this one will be absorbed on the left-hand side, well, just the part starting from uh, for a large um, lambda. But this is only possible if this one is small enough, so smaller than 1 plus all the constants that we picked up, so small enough. And I can reformulate this, and this just means this is this condition, because k to the q grows exponentially, OK? And what happens in our context? We do not prove redistribution estimates. Instead, we prove that the oscillations of u are directly smaller than epsilon times the averages of grad u. And now, we put around here the norms, and then we use here the fact that I can go back from the maximum operator to the sharp operator with this linear constant. So the only thing that we need for smallness is that epsilon times q is small enough, and then we can absorb it. So you see the, the approaches 
are different already in, I mean, how much exponent you can treat. Okay, let me summarize. These are again my co-authors. And um, these are the equations. So we have considered weighted equations with matrix valued weights. Um, they should be can scalar or vector va uh, matrix value, positive definite matrices. We have allowed degenerate elliptic weights in the sense that the condition numbers. Somebody saying something? Oh, okay. Uh, degenerate elliptic weights. I cannot understand anything. Uh, the condition number is uniformly bounded. Um, so whenever our exponent, uh, whenever our oscillation is smaller than one over Q or one over the reciprocal index, then you have transfer regularity. So this is in the linear context. In, in the nonlinear, we can only go to exponents bigger than the natural one. And if the oscillations are smaller than one over Q times the constant, then we also have transfer of regularity. So the conditions that we use here, the log condition, it scales well. We've seen by the Myers example that the estimates are sharp. So the only thing you can, in uh, Myers example, it's a different constant here, but the relation is the same. And you can always think of this model example, just take the identity matrix, which is certainly simple. You put here some degenerate weight, which can go to zero and infinity, depending on your choice of delta. Okay, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I hope that you all have some questions and that you are still there because I didn't see you for for 50 minutes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lars. And please let us thank speaker. So please, wait, I, I see one. I see, I just saw one hand, but um, it disappeared. Was it a question? No? Yes. Okay, qu questions, please. Questions. Oh, then, as usual, I have a comment. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Lars, for this impressive lecture. I really appreciated your lecture very much. And uh, I think this type of results and that you have this type of way are very important for applications also. Uh, because you can pick up, of, of, of course, in the normal case, what you have to the right hand side is in data and what you have uh, to the left hand side, uh, you want to have the solution of this. It's the, what comes out from the system. And uh, of course, uh, what happened with the, um, the Laplace equation, it's uh, in all books that is very important, but P Laplace equation is as important for uh, several applications when you have P different from two. And uh, to have such weights, it can help you, you know, when you have singularities in the problem. You, you don't have a solution of this problem that you uh, uh, have uh, some measure of uh, the energy of what you put inside to uh, to what you get out from the system in uh, the normal LP norm or something like this. But you can get it in some function space if you have uh, weights. You can really get the uh, 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 so I think results of this type and that you variate the space here is very important. Because they know from practical point of view that you have a solution, but you you cannot prove it, uh, or you have such uh, energy solution of some type. Uh, but they cannot prove it because you have the not correct function space. So I think this uh, type of questions and that you try to variate is very important, not only for pure mathematics. It's my small question. And uh, remark. <laughs> Thanks. You're mute. Thank you, thank you, Lars. And 
Okay, more questions, please. Uh, maybe I have a small question. Lars, knowing your great knowledge of variable expense analysis, I would like to ask you whether it's visible that um, some part of this result can be uh, generalized to a variable exponent case. Um, well, I have not looked into this one. So, I mean, we have uh, studied a little bit in this direction with Jehan O and there's papers with Ock where um, well, you have this P of X. And then somehow in, instead of this, you would look at this. And the first question would be what kind of what is a good measure to measure the oscillations of P just to allow for this theory. And most times people just use this uh, lock holder condition. But I think the one from Minjona, the paper that's still state of the art or uh, is um, that you use vanishing lock holder conditions, so something that goes to zero a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. Then there's this very nice paper by Spock where he says like it's well you don't need vanishing, you make makes it more precise. He says a, a specific kind of Dini condition, but uh, this is basically just measuring the smoothness of P, but in a similar sense like we do it here. Yes, yeah? something very similar uh, because mm -hmm. it measures uh, ex this oscillations of one over P. Um, Combining the two things, I have never seen because um, there are fundamental uh, difficulties. So if you look, for example, at this nice book of Peter Heste and Petri um, the they, uh, they study the case PX as well as the more general case. But unfortunately, right now, the, the, the setting with weight and PX is this kind of excluded from the whole of the theory. So there are some fundamental steps like Poincaré's inequalities and things which have not been studied. So maybe this task here is a little bit too difficult to combine it directly because maybe these simpler questions of Poincaré's inequality have to be solved first um, for weighted uh, spaces. Yeah, so I don't know. There's not much space like just let's say Poincaré, but uh, you would have let's say M of X grad U Px, um, something like this. So this smaller is by the same term with gradient um, p of x uh, plus something extra. So that you kind of have Poincaré. That's not clear in this context already. So that's the very first step in this proof. So these things have to be solved first, I think. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, more questions, please. comments. Connected, connected to Poincaré inequalities, there are also some very new results of Ritva Hervé-Syrian, which maybe can be helpful. And, and also what I know, and, and also PIC have some very new results there. Uh, for for very exponent or for all its setting or what was it? Uh, they work with different spaces, but also with this exponential spaces they have tried. I think. I see. Yeah. Yeah. They have very uh, nice. Yeah. And it, it's very interesting this uh, uh, spaces you you have here with this x log construction. It. it uh, it's 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 very natural construction in some sense, you know. It almost like uh, yeah, um, yeah. What to say when you have power means and you you get uh, in instead you know geometric mean, and this is some oh, high, high really level, you know. Yeah. This x log construction is a natural construction for me. exactly. It gives you some space with lies between the space and the dual space. So this is very, very, I mean, this is how we started. We, we started basically with this thing, the project. We said like, there is this very nice uh, logarithmic mean, which is stable under duality, and we should use it to improve some PD estimates. So we picked this project just from starting from the function space result, basically, that it's compatible with duality. And then we said, let's go. Let's hit the PDE, and in the end, we were happy to get a better result with better dependency on the constants. So, but we started with the motivation from the function spaces. 
And this was also very interesting, this detail you show here, you know, that uh, the Muckenhoff condition that you divided into two here. Uh, this is not our idea, this is classical, yeah? But what? This is a classical thing, it's not from ours. Yes, this is a yeah. classical thing, but it's, it's, a, very, it is a, a very good trick. Exactly. Okay, please, more questions. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank speaker again for a very nice talk. You can turn on.